and welcome to this short tutorial in which I explain how to conduct chi-squared tests in RStudio. First of all, let's get some data. And the data uh, come from Graham Rabbi, who was a PhD student at Carleton University. He collected data on the win rate of Tim Hortons Roll Up the Rim coffees, where every March uh, Tim Hortons have an advertised campaign in which uh, they uh, promote their coffee by giving um, buyers of the coffee a chance to uh, win small prizes from donuts all the way up to a, a car. Let's have a look at these data and I'm actually going to first of all put the data in a matrix and then we're going to name the columns and here are what the data looked like. From 2011 to 2013, Graham Rabbi and his colleagues in the Fish Lab wrote down on a whiteboard whether they had been lucky enough to win a prize or they didn't win a prize. And you'll see here what we have are the year and uh, whether the individual cup won and there is clearly a high number of individual cups that are not winning uh, throughout these three years. The first question we can ask ourselves is is there an association between winning and not winning and year, i.e. does the probability of winning vary between years? We can ask this question by conducting a chi-squared test of uh, independence of uh, this form of classification versus this form. So let's do that to begin with. There's the chi-squared test and uh, I'm actually not going to go for Yates continuity correction because it really doesn't have very much effect uh, when we're dealing with numbers of this size. Here's what we have. Uh, we have an estimated test statistic which we compare with the chi-squared of 0.188 there are two degrees of freedom because it's two times one the number of rows minus one times columns minus one and the p-value is about 0.91 this tells us that the probability of obtaining that test statistic or a more extreme if the null hypothesis of no association between these forms of classifications were true uh, is relatively high it's 0.91 so we don't have good grounds to reject that null hypothesis. Uh, we can continue by combining our data over all of those years. Let's have a look at what that combined data would look like. There's the observed frequencies. Overall 136 wins and 488 losses. Here's the question. Tim Hortons argue that there is a 1 in 6 chance overall of winning a prize. From the data that we have, our observations of 136 wins and 488 losses, can we reject the null hypothesis that the data are derived from a population with attributes 1 sixth winning and 5 sixths not winning? Let's have a look at that. Here are uh, the chi-squared test results uh, where the probability distribution is 1 sixth here and 5 sixth here uh, fitted to our observed frequencies. And of course we can have a look at those results uh, there. And in this case we can reject the null hypothesis which generated those expected frequencies of 1 sixth versus 5 sixth which is of interest because our value of our test statistic is above and beyond what you would expect if the null hypothesis uh, of conforming to those expectations was true. In what way are we seeing this deviation from the expected? So uh, here we can say results expected and we can actually see uh, that the expected outcome if indeed we had the same number of coffees distributed in 1 6 to 5 6 is 104 and yet we have a higher uh, observed win rate of 136 and a lower uh, rate of lossing here we've got 488 compared to 520. 
So it appears for some reason that we have a higher win rate, a significantly higher win rate uh, than 1 in 6 as advertised. What are the reasons for that? Well, maybe the particular coffee place where most of the students were buying their coffee had a very good batch. That's probably unlikely because I think the Tim Hortons go to some length to try and randomize the winning cups over the entire country. Perhaps more likely, the students that won prizes were very much keener to write uh, their win on the board than those individuals that uh, didn't win. They would simply forget it. So it might potentially be a reporting bias, although of course that needs further investigation. Here are some more data now, and it's along the same lines uh, with regard to the data uh, in terms of years, but here this is in terms of the cup sizes. Here are the win rate for small cups and the loss. This is the wins for medium cups and the number of medium cups that didn't win and the number of large cups that won a prize and the number of uh, large cups that didn't. So the question we can ask here is is there an association between winning and not winning and the size of cup? You might expect if customers paid more for their larger cups then you might hope that the win rate would be that much higher. Well we can test this by again looking at a simple chi-squared test for association between winning and not winning and the size of cup. Let's have a look. We've created our observed in terms of a matrix and now simply we have uh, to do the chi-squared test. It's called a Pearson chi-squared test because strictly speaking the test statistic we calculate isn't chi-squared itself of course it's the test statistic that we compare with the chi-squared distribution, distribution in this case for the number of rows minus 2 times columns minus 2 which is 2 degrees of freedom. In this case we get a relatively high p-value and so we cannot reject the null hypothesis that the win rate is independent of the size of cups. Of course we can also look at our expected values and we simply use uh, the expected uh, here with the dollar sign and this would give us what we would expect if the null hypothesis of there being no association was true. Finally, other people have asked the same sort of question, although with somewhat smaller data sets than Graham Rabbi was able to accumulate uh, over that three-year period. In particular, I noticed that the Huffington Post ran an article where they argued that there was some evidence to suggest that larger cups were more likely to give a reward. Here are their data, and let's have a look at what their data uh, actually uh, look like. The first thing you'll note is that the sample sizes are really very low compared to Graham Rabbi's multi-year study. Here we have five cups uh, which were extra large that won and 13 which were extra large and didn't win. And there is the large, the medium and the small. So eyeballing these data, it really does look like the win rate is higher for very large cups than it is with smaller cups. But we must bear in mind that these are sample data, not population data. And yet we want to draw inferences about the population from which these samples were derived. How can we do that? Well, clearly, what we need to do is to test for an association between winning and not winning and the size of cup, just as we did before. Let's have a look at what that looks like. The first thing is that we get a warning message. This warning message arises because our expected values in this analysis are all relatively small. In this case, a number of them must be less than five. 
This is an important concern because the chi-squared test uh, depends on the assumption that the expected frequencies are all relatively large and in this case it assumes that the majority if not all of the expected frequencies are greater than 5. But nevertheless let's have a look at the results and then we can reinspect the expected values and uh, work out what to do. Here are the results. With this particular analysis uh, we get a test statistic of 2.67 uh, which really would arise on relatively high proportion of cases that value or a more extreme if the null hypothesis of there being no association between cup size and winning uh, were true. So with this limited provisional analysis we have no solid evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the win rate is independent of the cup size. Now let's go back to those expected values and have a look at them. It turns out there are three cells here with an expected value of uh, 2.93 which clearly is less than 5. So here remember that the validity of this approximation of the test statistic to the chi-squared really is called into question when your expected values are so low. Well, What can we do about this? Well, one solution is to conduct a so-called Fisher's exact test. Now Fisher's exact test does make assumptions. In particular, there are limiting assumptions in terms of experimental control over the row totals or column totals. For example, uh, it might assume that uh, only a fixed quota number of uh, cups of a given size uh, were investigated. So there are limitations, but sometimes it's very hard to find a perfect statistical model which is valid uh, in uh, all respects with respect to uh, the assumptions. So let's have a look at conducting a Fisher's exact test. Here we've already created the matrix and with Fisher's exact test we simply uh, call up Fisher.test uh, on that matrix. We get a very similar p-value of 0.4484. And yet you'll notice that uh, we're not computing any test statistic which is compared with a chi-squared. In this case, Fisher's exact test is a simple permutation test we are asking on the basis of those observed frequencies what's the probability of obtaining that outcome or a more extreme if the null hypothesis of there being no association were true and in this case it's about 44-45 uh, percent. So here again we have no evidence despite the Huffington Post's preliminary assertions that there is a relationship between cup size and uh, win rate. We cannot reject the null hypothesis that there is no association.